Welcome to the Robert G. Hisaoka Speaker Series, and thank you all for coming today. I'm Holly DeArmond. I am the Managing Director of the Dingman Center for Entrepreneurship at the Robert H. Smith School of Business. Um, and this series is now in its seventh, I can't believe it, installment, and it's made possible through a generous gift from Mr. Bob Hisaoka to the, D the Dingman Center. And the purpose of this Robert G. Hisaoka Speaker Series is to bring business leaders and startup founders to campus where they can inspire students, and I think I see some alumni out there and some faculty and staff, but inspire you to explore business and entrepreneurship. So thank you for being here. I would like to personally thank Mr. Hisaoka for this generous gift and for his continued support of our center. But I'd also like to thank the team responsible for executing his vision, and that is Jessica Davies, Donna White Sneed, and Megan McPherson. So before we welcome our guests to stage, I would like to tell you more about the namesake of our speaker series. Mr. Hisaoka is a 1979 accounting graduate from the University of Maryland. And in 2013, he received the Smith School's Alumnus of the Year Award. And he was also named a distinguished alumnus at the University of Maryland that same year. He's the president of Luxury Imports of Bowling Green and BMW of Bowling Green. He's an active angel and venture investor who is on the board of Psionic Mobile, Precise Target, Hungry Marketplace, and Mars Real. He's a member of the Economic Club of Washington, D.C., and a former trustee of the Federal City Council. He has run and co-owned some of the largest automobile dealerships in the United States. In 2011, he was nominated as one of only 52 automobile dealers for the Time Dealer of the Year Award, the automobile industry's most prestigious award for new car dealers. Recipients are among the nation's most successful auto dealers, but they must also demonstrate a longstanding commitment to community service. In June of 2015, he was awarded a Mercedes Best of the Best jacket as one of 53 Mercedes dealerships recognized for elite performance. Mr. Hisoka is also an active philanthropist. In 2007, he became an investor in Venture Philanthropy Partners, a philanthropic investment organization that helps nonprofits improve the lives of children from low-income families in the National Capital Region. And in 2008, Mr. Hisoka founded and now chairs the Joan Hisaoka Gala to honor his late sister Joan and to fulfill her desire to help others living with cancer. The gala supports organizations that bring hope and healing to those faced with serious illness. And the gala has raised approximately $16 million in only 12 years. It's incredible. And in 2013, Mr. Hisaoka was honored by Inova Health System with the Building Our Legacy in Cancer Award. He's also been named for the last 10 years to Washington Life Magazine's Philanthropic 50 and to Washington Life's Power 100 list in 2013. He was named an honoree of the SAC Cancer Gala by the Washington Redskins Charitable Foundation and the American Cancer Society in 2014. Mr. Hisaoka is the chairman of the advisory board of the Inova Shark Cancer Institute. He formerly served on the advisory board of the Smith School, the Board of Washington 2024, the Maya Angelou C. Forever Foundation Board of Directors, and the DC Region Board of Teach for America. He supports other nonprofit organizations focusing on health, education, and sports. Mr. Hisaoka holds a fourth degree black belt in judo and won many national and international judo competitions. He was training to make the 1980 USA Olympic team, but his judo career was cut short by a knee injury. So, but his gift to the center um, has presented University of Maryland students with an invaluable opportunity to learn from successful and talented entrepreneurs. And we hope you're as excited as my team is to hear from our next speaker. So without further ado, I would now like to welcome to the stage Robert G. Hisaoka and Seth Goldman. Seth is the co-founder and 
CEO Emeritus of Honest Tea and the executive chairman of Beyond Meat, a plant-based meat substitute company. And we're just excited to have you here. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. It's great to be here. Well, thank you. And without further ado, we're gonna sort of start in the early years. Seth had such an impressive academic background, graduated from Harvard College, MBA from Yale University, a Henry Crown Fellow from uh, the Aspen Institute, and the only distinguished education he probably doesn't have on there is from the University of Maryland. That's right. <laughs> so, other, other than that though, all the finest institutions in the, in the United States. Uh, please tell us a little bit about your college experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, first of all, I want to just acknowledge how wonderful it is that you're supporting entrepreneurship and supporting your uh, alma mater. It's uh, well, something you. that everyone really should emulate. It's, it's great and, and wonderful to be back on campus here. I was actually up in Cambridge today where I, you know, I went to school, and so it did bring back some memories. And um, I think the best way to think about my education in college was that I was modeling all the behaviors that I still do today. And what I mean by that is I was involved in lots of different activities. So I was on the track team. I ran cross country and track, so a three season athlete. I was also on a acapella singing group and also involved in uh, musical theater um, and it involved in student politics as well. I was the chair of, this is gonna date me, but um, Mike Dukakis, who was the governor of Massachusetts when I was there was running for governor and I was the head of his campus campaign. And so, and of course I was doing st a, a student as well. <laughs> Try to remember that. Um, and so I, you know, the thread there was that I was doing multitasking. I was able to balance lots of different activities all at the same time. And I didn't think about it that way. I was just, it had a lot of different interests and, and I, I couldn't sort of get one particular interest identified. So I was doing lots of things, but that actually served me really well um, to be able to you know, focus just on, on athletics or you know, running and then to just go over and focus on uh, singing or studying and, and um, Basically, when you become an entrepreneur, by definition, you can't only do the thing you love. You have to be able to do everything kind of all at once. So multitasking certainly uh, yeah. has been a part of your career. Yeah. Is there any specific advice uh, that you give to the aspiring entrepreneurs yeah. in our audience about I, maximizing yeah. their time? At, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to put a uh, burden on you, but it, like what you're doing in college is modeling whatever you're doing, however, you know, whatever it is you are modeling future behavior. And so uh, what I mean by that is if, you know, whether, if you're treating people with respect, uh, if you are um, thinking about people in a, in a personable way, that's how you'll act in the future. Don't, don't fool yourself into thinking, well, I'm gonna just act how I act in college and when I get out, I'm gonna change my behavior. Like what you do in college is very much um, setting yourself on the path for how you, how you'll be in the future, and, and it's even, to put it in marketing terms, you're building your brand, right? Your activity, when someone sees you walking down the hall, you know, a, a brand is a promise, and so when someone sees you walking down the hall, what are the associations they have? Oh, this is the person who, like, fill in the blank, you know, is this the person who's gonna go join whatever the, the crowd is doing, or is this the person who's gonna stand up for whatever they believe, or is this the person who's gonna, you know, um, not be friendly or not be personal, whatever it is, that you're, those are behavior patterns that you're already establishing. So, so um, it's not too early to start thinking about how you'd like to see yourself in your career and start acting that way in that's, college. That's great advice. <laughs> Seth, in the late 1990s, co-founded Honest Tea, and it really happened after he took a run in Central Park and got thirsty and was looking for a drink, and at the time, there were really no suitable alternatives, and it sort of, developed into an aha moment that created Honest Tea. So could you tell us about that? Yeah, so I, I, um, I had an entrepreneurial itch. I was working in Bethesda, well, it was where I, my family and I had moved, and so I was working in the investment business. Uh, and I enjoyed it, it was a good organization, a good company to be with, but I always was sort of thinking, boy, if I could find the right idea, I'd love to create something. And I had a bunch of different ideas that I was sort of playing around with. Um, but this one, unexpected, came to me. That went, as you said, it went, uh, I, I was in a New York for a presentation. After the presentation, I went for a run in Central Park. After the run, I was thirsty. I went to the beverage cooler, 
and I was with a, a former teammate of mine from the track team. I said, there's nothing in this cooler. He said, well, what do you mean there's nothing? There's, there's you know, dozens of options. I said, yeah, but they're all the same. They all have the same calorie level. They all have the same main ingredient, which is high fructose corn syrup. Um, they're just, the difference is color, maybe fizz or no fizz, label. Um, th there's nothing different here. And um, I kind of realized, you know, that's an idea I can get excited about. Um, and for me, some of the other ideas I was thinking about when I was um, working in the investment field were creative, interesting ideas, but they weren't ones I felt personally passionate about. And of course, I had no experience in the beverage industry, but I did have experience drinking beverages because I was, uh, since I was a runner, I was always thirsty. <laughs> and so finding a drink that was going to quench my thirst was something I could get excited about. And um, I reached back out to my professor from business school, Barry Nailbuff, um, and when I was his student, we had done a case study of the beverage industry, and we had talked about different ways to compete. And at the time, the, the case study is called the Cola Wars, was studying how Coke and Pepsi had competed against each other, and one had more creative tactics than another. But the, what the case kind of highlighted is that, you know, these were just two companies competing head to head. And competition, when you're competing head to head, really is going to be determined mostly by resources, who has more money or who's willing to maybe make a little creative idea. But competition like that is very stilted. Um, and when you can think about competition in three dimensions, it's totally different. So rather than just compete cola, pep, Coke versus Pepsi, what if you think about, well, what if you're a different sweetness level? What if your drink is different than what's out there? And we had got excited about that idea, and Barry at the time had said, oh, let's do some focus groups, let's make some samples, and I'm like, I gotta find a job, which people here can relate to. Um, but I reached back out to Barry, I said, you know, when we had talked about that idea, we had some interesting um, excitement, we, had some, we were excited about it, I think I'm ready to do something about this. And Barry had just come back from India, where he had been studying the tea industry, and he had come up with the name Honest Tea. And for me, that was kind of like a mind-blowing moment when he shared that I, the name, because then I got how I could take all the passion I have around social and justice and, and environmental impact and connect them to a brand. And so I, I felt like that was, that was worth exploring. And, and is it true that you started Honest Tea off of five thermoses yeah, of tea? Yeah. So I left my job in the investment world and uh, managed to get an appointment with Whole Foods, uh, which was at the time just 17 stores here in the mid-Atlantic and brewed up five thermoses of tea in my kitchen and we got an empty Snapple bottle, we pasted a label on and I brought it to the buyer and I said, I wanna sell this in your store. <laughs> and the buyer said, well, why is it different? And I said, it's different because all your drinks are really sweet and this, is, this isn't sweet. He said, all right, well, we'll, we'll take 15,000 bottles, we'll try that. And that was terrifying because you know, I'd only made it in my kitchen. And then, and then he said, um, and you know what we do here is we'll take those 15,000 bottles, we'll put them on the shelf and if they sell, we'll pay you for them. And if they don't sell, you know, uh, we learn something. <laughs> I said, well, I appreciate that offer, but the whole business is me and these thermoses and the bottle, empty Snapple bottle, so I really need you to buy the bottles. Um, and uh, he, he agreed, which you know, I'm, I'm still thankful to Whole Foods that they did, and uh, so that, that's how we got to the shelf. And I guess it was 2011 that you sold the company to Coca-Cola. Yeah, yeah. And I believe this is correct, it's on 150,000 plus uh, different locations now? Yeah, yeah, all over the world. So I was just in um, yeah, Europe last week and we're in, uh, across Europe and Spain in particular. But uh, um, yeah, we're in places like uh, McDonald's and Wendy's and Chick-fil-A and Subway as well. So one of, the, one of the big motivators for the business was to democratize healthy products. We don't, I mean, we love healthy people. We wish everyone was healthy, but the goal was never just to sell healthy drinks just to healthy people. Let's make these available, organic, lower calorie drinks available everywhere drinks are sold. And um, what's, the reason it was wonderful for us to partner with Coca-Cola is because it's the world's largest beverage distribution system. So to be able to scale the business, not just here in the United States, but around the world is something that uh, would, would have taken a very long time to happen. Uh, and, and, it's, and now it's happening, and it's, so it is, it's, it's gratifying to go to different um, countries and see the Honest brand, and, and wherever we see it, it's a less sweet drink, it's organic. Uh, we just launched the first Fairtrade certified <clears throat> drinks that Coca-Cola offers in Europe, so that's starting now, and it's, it's, it's spreading. And this is sort of off topic, but who came up with T-E-O <laughs> Emeritus? Well, so we're always, um, 
thinking differently, right? I, you know, just as just as we never want to compete head to head, you know, any for us at least, as any entrepreneur really, you should if you're in a conventional mindset as an entrepreneur, you you're probably not setting yourself up for success. So, um, you know, we thought, well, look, what's the most important thing about honest tea at the time was well, having great tea, and so let's make me the tea executive officer. Uh, what, the reason we added the emeritus is after um, 2015, I shifted into a, a part-time role. So I still work with Coca-Cola, but I also got involved with Beyond Meat. And so I couldn't call myself the TEO because obviously it was really CEO. And so um, since my parents are both professors at a university, when you are no longer actively a professor, you become an emeritus. And so I am the TEO emeritus. That's a great story. <laughs> And what are some of the lessons that you learned as far as building the business from scratch and a conglomerate that was purchased by Coke? Yeah. Well, one of the things that's great about building a business from scratch is you really have to learn every aspect of the business. And it still serves me well today, meaning I had to design labels and I had to make label language and I had to learn all about the compliance for you know, the FDA. Um, I had to make all the purchase orders, so I had to understand what are the, what's the price and how the purchase orders, what are the terms that we get with a bottle supplier, meaning when do we pay them. Um, I had to learn distribution. I mean, I mean, I had to learn every aspect. And so what that, the reason that continues to serve me well is because when I'm in a meeting, um, nobody can BS me. Nobody's going to be able to try to put some language past me that I can't understand or you know, um, pretend that I, I'm not interested or not aware of it. And so they have that foundation. And of course, it also carries over into other businesses. So, you know, as with Beyond Meat as well. Um, so I always encourage entrepreneurs to make sure they really understand every part of a business. And, you know, a lot of times in a, when a graduate comes out of a school and they work for a new company, they may do a rotation and get exposed to all types of things. But it's even better when you can be the entrepreneur who literally is, you know, exposed to all of that. So that was certainly one thing. The other piece is, um, and this, for me is more than any lesson is you've got to be passionate about what you're doing. You've got to be involved in a business that you could work on 24 hours a day and, and, and not, you know, feel drained. Um, and so, uh, not that I encourage anyone to work 24 hours a day, but the point is that um, this is a business that I feel so passionate, all the, all the aspects of it. So I'm, a, I'm passionate about the health aspect of what we're selling. I'm passionate about the sustainability piece because of the organic ingredients. I'm passionate about the economic opportunity piece, the fair trade, uh, which you know helps us create economic opportunity around the world. And so, um, having that as the underpinning of the business has made it not—it's not work. It's you know, my my father said the best work you can do is when you can get paid to do what you would pay to do. And uh, I feel very fortunate that I, I'm in that position. That's great. And you touched upon it a little bit, but talk a little bit, please, about the challenges you face with balancing work and family life. Yeah. You know, so, so there's an interesting question. Is being an entrepreneur a sprint or a marathon, right? I mean, at, at least I put it in, in running terms. And there are moments when we absolutely need to sprint. But I take the mindset of a marathoner. And what I mean by that is a good marathoner doesn't only run. Uh, you've got to have a strong base. If you have a strong base your whole body holds up. If you only run, it's much easier to get injured because you'll just wear out uh, uh, parts of your body. Um, and so I think about life as having a strong base. And by, what I mean by that is um, to be effective in my work, I have to have a solid foundation of people and places that, I, that help give me strength. And so for me, my, my, certainly my family is a, is a key part of my the, the core part of what, what gives me strength, and, and it's my most immediate family, my wife and three sons, and uh, I guess as Barry says, I'm, I'm married to the same <laughs> person I am when I started the business, um, and I'm incredibly close to my three sons. They actually, two of them just came back and, and lived in our house. They're now 27 and 25. Our youngest is 22, so he's out sort of seeking his way, but we hope to bring him back into the fold at some point. Uh, and I'm still close to my broader family. I was just up visiting my mother in Boston this morning, um, who she's up in Cambridge. And so that for me is a core part of that. And I'm, I'm always, uh, obviously there's moments where I have to choose family or work and, and work wins. But uh, in, the, in the big picture, I'm never going to sacrifice family for success at work. And then in addition to that, physically taking care of myself. Um, you know, this, this work is draining. And I was up at, because I had to go to Boston, make sure I could make it back here in time. I was up actually at 3.30 this morning. Um, but because I'm always physically active, I have 
a lot of um, strength and, and, and reserves of energy that helped me. You know, I, I um, on Monday went back and forth to Los Angeles for the Beyond Meat earnings call, and, and doing that in one day could be a little draining, but um, you know, able to just move and, and be able to have that physical strength is important because the single biggest uh, reserve or resource an entrepreneur has is his or her own personal energy. And so you've got to, as an entrepreneur, you've got to lead a team, you've got to, keep, you've got to inspire people, you've got to have them be energized. And if I'm drained or if I'm sick, uh, if I'm not enthusiastic, I can't spread that. Um, and, and, and alternatively, if, I'm, if I am drained, if, I'm not, if I don't have that energy, I, I'm not, people are gonna cue, take cues from how, how I act. So um, certainly physical and uh, familiar, family um, foundations are key, but I think spiritually, and everyone may find their own peace. You know, for me, when I'm running, I'm also connecting to the natural world. I never use a treadmill. Like I'll, I'd rather run in the rain or the cold and just be connected to the natural world around me. Um, it's a wonderful way to feel a little bit of humility and a little bit of appreciation for the world around you. Um, and, and so those are some of the things. And, and then um, spiritually, you know, um, I, I, my wife and I do, you know, we, we um, are, are Jewish and we so do participate in rituals and just things that help us feel connected to a, a broader piece of, of the world and, and, and to history as well. One of the very impressive things you've done also is you co-wrote a book called Mission in a Bottle, which I read and thoroughly enjoyed. I believe it was a New York Times bestseller. Yeah. And it was written in comic book format. What inspired you to write the book and how long did it take you? Yeah, so this is a fun one. So um, at the time, uh, so we wrote the book in 2013. We, the idea came around 2011, just after we sold to Coca-Cola. And I felt like we had a story to tell. I wanted to help inspire people to understand this path on business, mission-driven business can succeed, and how do you do it, and how do you create it? And I, at the time, I was trying to think, well, is it worth reading, writing a business book? And I, w I read a bunch of books by entrepreneurs, how I did it, entrepreneurs, and I found a lot of the books falling into the same pattern, mostly which was like patting myself on the back, and you know, um, and the first chapter was interesting because they talk about their challenges, and then they'd start, it, uh, very rarely do you finish those books. And at the time, uh, my oldest son was a senior in high school, and he had just gotten into college. So this was his senior spring, and he was in that senior slump where, hey, I got into college, I don't really need to study, and my job was to keep him on task. And I, I'd go up, and he, he, he's dyslexic, so he always gravitated towards comic books. And um, I'd say, Jonah, you got to do your homework. You, you know, if, you, if you get really bad grades, you, you may lose your acceptance. He said, yeah, but look at this comic book. It's so interesting. And so I found myself being pulled into the comic books uh, the way he was, and I realized that would be a, a really unique way to tell a story about honest tea, and there's so many visual elements, whether it's the tea gardens you saw, or the label design, or the bottling plant. Um, and I also realized that if we could make it a comic book, we'd bring in a much different group, a much broader group of people to take an interest in our story. If we just wrote text, we're not gonna get people, but whether it's people who are dyslexic, or people who learn differently, well, which is, probably most people, um, then a comic book would be a fun way to do it. And, and now, um, whenever I am approached by entrepreneurs, the first thing I tell them is, well, read the, read the book, um, because you'll get all the, the lessons and, and mistakes we made, and then if we, we want to talk after that, happy to talk. Yeah, it really is a very good uh, book, and Thanks, really man. enjoyed Thank reading you. it. Um, you know, one of the things that is impressive is you believe every... Uh, business should have a mission, right. and I was wondering, how did you come up with your mission, and how did that follow your passion? Yeah, um, well, you know, it, it, it's funny. So we started just with less sweet tea. Like, that, that was the initial idea, less sweet, and we knew if it was less sweet, um, there was going to be a health benefit because um, there's so much sugar in the drinks that were out there. So that was, a, that was the founding principle. As we started to learn more about um, the way tea is grown, we realized that um, tea leaves are one of the few products where they're never rinsed. So if, if chemicals are sprayed on tea leaves, or you know, if you spray chemicals on a tomato or an apple, you can take it home, you rinse it, you peel it, you'll get most of those chemicals off. But if they're sprayed on tea leaves, the chemicals aren't rinsed off until you pour hot water on the leaves, and so they'd end up in the tea. Uh, and as we learned about um, pesticides and herbicides and fungicides, the, the root of those words, side, is the same as homicide. You know, it's kill. It's to kill a living organism. 
And we realized, well, if these chemicals are killing living organisms, we probably don't want even trace amounts of them in our bodies, let alone in the ecosystem. So we said, well, that would mean that if you can go organic and not use chemical pesticides, that would be a better thing for the planet and these ecosystems, as well as for the consumer. Uh, and then as we started, I started to visit the tea gardens, and I saw that tea is really one of the world's cheapest commodities. It's, it's um, you know, uh, pennies a bottle. Even though we use the best tea in the world, it's pennies a bottle, which meant that um, we could spend, you know, a penny and a half a penny and actually help invest in these communities and create economic opportunity for these communities um, and do that in a way that without raising our prices. And so um, organic was the first step and then fair trade was the next step and we were the first to make organic bottle tea and then the first to make fair trade bottle tea and we, we were, um, then we were also chose to, to go out and buy fair trade sugar. And so um, just through doing business, there's a, a, a strong impact element. And I, one of the things that I like about a mission driven business is that Every time we sell a bottle, we're having an impact. We don't have to make profit. We don't have to um, make choices. Embedded in the way the business works, we're making people, we're giving them a healthier option, we're giving them an environmentally more sustainable option, and we're helping to create economic opportunity. And, and what we do in some of these communities, you saw just a, uh, in the video a, glimmer, a glimpse of it, but investing in schools, investing in eye care, investing in uh, health care, um, and, and investing in infrastructure that creates economic self-sufficiency for these communities is, is something that's really exciting to see. And along those lines, relatively recently, Honest Tea developed children's drinks. Yes, yeah. And are in McDonald's now? Yeah, so that's a funny story because it shows, so you'll, you'll hear a theme, and, and I, I, I said I'm very close to my sons, but <laughs> my sons have given me incredible um, ideas. That um, when my middle son was 12 years old, I was, uh, my job in the family uh, household was making the school lunches and, and was basically just putting a bunch of stuff in the lunchbox. And he said, Dad, how come, how come you're selling healthy drinks to grown-ups, but you're putting really sugary drinks in my lunchbox? And, and uh, I was putting those blue pouches in, which a lot of people know. And those blue pouches had 100 calories per pouch, which was more sugar per ounce than is in a can of soda. And that's what I was putting in my son's lunchbox, which essentially means I wasn't really thinking about it. I just... And I said, wow, there's an idea here. And we said, well, if you take the equities of honest tea, organic and low calorie, and you put that in a kid's drink, you could call it honest kids. And so um, we brought that out first in Whole Foods again. Um, and initially we sweetened it with sugar, it was 40 calories against their 100. Um, but then as we started to grow this business, we, and we started working with Coca-Cola, we said, let's take out all the sugar and just sweeten it with juice, which the calories are the same, so nutritionally it's the same, but the optics look much better. And of course, all these big fast food chains are under pressure to make sure they're offering healthier products. And the fun thing about Honest Kids is the way we formulated it, and this is a terrible marketing slogan, but we made it just sweet enough so a kid would not reject it. And so the, um, the idea was that if it's in the lunchbox, if the kid hates it, they'll come home and say, you know, mom or dad, don't put that in my lunchbox again. But if they're like, ah, it's okay. By the time they get through the week, they're, they're used to it. And actually, the power of that is if you can acclimate a young person's taste buds for less sweet drinks, you change the trajectory of, of what they'll consume. And so um, just by uh, McDonald's alone, we, we put it in McDonald's more than a year ago now. We've sold over 200 million units. It's a, it's a 35 calorie drink. It replaced an 80 calorie drink. So there's a 45 calorie differential times over 200 million. We've helped remove over a billion calories from the American diet just by having honest kids in McDonald's. Yeah. So that's some of the excitement when you get to scale a business like this. That's so impressive. And Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Well, switching the topic for a moment, you're the executive chair of uh, Beyond Meat, and one of the things that well, we all probably know about is that it's the hottest <laughs> uh, IPO. It IPO'd in May of this year and is up some 400% and is the hottest IPO, not only this year, but in probably 20 years. And uh, the interesting thing about it, though, is that you got involved in 2012 yeah. when it was doing less than a million dollars in sales. So what did you see at that time that made you get involved? So I'll start first with how I became a vegetarian. I talked about my kids. So my oldest son, when he was um, 10, he became vegetarian. And by the time he got to, and by the time he was 11 or 12, he convinced his brothers, mostly because he was the big brother and, and they didn't want to 
<laughs> sort of get um, criticized by him all the time. By the time he got to be 13, it was his bar mitzvah, and he had a, um, his Torah portion was about the kosher laws, preparation of, of, of meat, ironically. Uh, and so he was understanding, and in the, in the, the Torah talks about how you should separate the, the life from the death, the milk from the meat, the blood, so get rid of the blood, because the blood is the life, you shouldn't eat the life. And he says, well, if, if you don't want to eat the life, don't kill the animal. And, and if we can meet our dietary needs without killing animals, why wouldn't we do that? And um, so partially out of sympathy to him, I became vegetarian. My wife and I became vegetarian uh, 14 years ago when he was 13. And um, we were happy with the choice from an ethical perspective. We were not particularly happy with the choice from a culinary perspective. By that I mean that we just didn't like the taste of veggie burgers. It always felt like it was a sacrifice. And so in 2012, my wife was reading an article about this company getting started uh, out in California by a guy named Ethan Brown, who actually has connections to the University of Maryland. And it, the idea was to re replicate the taste and texture of meat from plants. And, and just quickly, I'll, I'll explain why that is different than what's, so veggie burgers basically is you mush a bunch of stuff together, you form it into a patty and you say, that's supposed to be a replacement for a hamburger. And the results are what they are. But Beyond Meat looked at it differently and said, let's understand what meat is. Let's do an MRI of a hamburger. Let's understand what it really is, is just an, an assembly of amino acids that form the protein, uh, lipids and, and trace minerals that, that you know, form the fats and, and some other elements, and of course, 70% water, just like our bodies. And all of those things exist in the plant kingdom. In fact, by definition, all meat comes from plants, right? Because the, the cow or the pig just uses, or the chicken uses, uh, its digestive and skeletal system convert plants into meat. That's you know harvested, the muscles harvested to meat. And so when you define meat by its composition and not by its origin, then you have a, a totally different approach to meat. And so what we've done at Beyond Meat, and uh, you know after I, I reached out to Ethan, I sent an, in, an email to info at beyondmeat.com and said, this sounds like an exciting idea. Uh, I've learned a lot about scaling food businesses and I'm hungry. Uh, let's see if we can, uh, I can help you out. And uh, Ethan was very receptive and I became an investor and board member. And uh, when I joined the company, it was under a million dollars in sales for the year. What we reported on Monday is that our, our, our um, quarter, third quarter sales were uh, 92 million, which is exciting you know, for a business that's grow, uh, yeah. growing extremely quickly. Absolutely. And I, I guess one of the big things, too, is that Beyond Meat is now carried in the meat section. That of, was a big breakthrough, yeah. So, so what happened is most, uh, you know, only about 5% of the population is vegan or vegetarian. And, un and until Beyond Meat, all of the vegan options were carried in, you know, the, 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 ve the veggie section. Uh, we went first to Whole Foods. Again, you'll, you'll notice a pattern as I talk. Um, we went to them and said, we want to put this in the meat section. And you know the buyer actually said, and it's funny, I'm actually seeing this buyer tomorrow, I'm friendly with him now, but he said, why, why would I want to meet with you? I, I, I don't eat veggie burgers, I don't buy veggie burgers. And we said, well, this isn't a veggie burger, you gotta try this. And we, we um, went into a conference room, we plugged in one of these griddles, and we just put the burger on, it started sizzling. And then it started to give off an aroma. And then he tasted it and it was juicy, it wasn't like a, um, a hockey puck. <laughs> he said, all right, this is, this is something different. And, and so Whole Foods was the first to put it there. And, um, quickly, the other chains followed, and it's been amazing to see now, the growth. And of course, the other big breakthrough is that uh, we got it into restaurant chains where they understood it's not just the typical veggie burger. You know, most restaurant chains were, I don't want to say ashamed of their veggie burger, but it was never more than 1% of their sales. And so we put it in chains like BurgerFi, and it became 5% of their sales, and, and you know, part of drawing in a new audience. And, and so we've now just, um, just in the past quarter, we've done tests uh, with uh, Subway and McDonald's. Uh, and just uh, last week, um, Dunkin' Donuts announced they're going chain-wide uh, starting November 3rd. So you guys can go to Dunkin' Donuts next week and start buying the, it's a breakfast sausage patty, the Beyond Breakfast Sausage Patty that we're carrying. So um, it's really- You heard it here first. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's really fun to see uh, how quickly consumers have responded to this product. Well, we were in Lethbridge, Alberta, of all places. Yes. And I was shocked when, on the window of Tim Hortons, they were advertising it's neat. Beyond yeah. Meat. And uh, it really has a, a far reach and growing very quickly. Yeah. What, what, and uh, without putting it in too big a term, but you know, historically, I mean, we're, we're going through a, a shift by the time uh, the students and the rest, by the time their children are growing up, they won't think of meat as only being protein from an animal. 
it'll be, you know, meat will be, a, it's a continuum, and there will still be, I, I, there will still be meat protein from an animal, but plant protein will be part of that continuum. And so that's, a, that's a, within the scope, you know, the, the arc of human evolution, we're living through something that wasn't here when you and I were growing up. You know, you've had huge successes in everything you've done, but not everything. I, I, I find it very <laughs> interesting, though, that you've, I've heard you say this, you've cut it down to very simplistic terms of, I was thirsty, created on his tea. I was hungry, there was yeah. no good alternatives. Yeah. So I got in the Beyond Meat. So yeah. you know, it was satisfying some basic needs and uh, obviously done tremendously well. Uh, I've literally gone with my gut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, your gut. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of the benefits of Beyond Meat, maybe in the carbon footprint. Sure, or yeah, that's, that's what's so powerful. So. Um, if you think about what it takes to, to, to make a hamburger, right? A cow um, is usually about 18 months before it's slaughtered. And so all the land, all the water involved to do that. And we, we worked with the University of Michigan to do a, a, a peer-reviewed life cycle analysis. Um, and we found that the Beyond Burger needs 99% less water, 93% less land um, to produce our product. And so as we think about feeding a, a, a world of 7 billion on its way to 10 billion, there just aren't enough earths out there to, to feed them the way the American consumer consumes its protein. Um, and so on the other hand, if you, if you say, well, it's really one, what is it, so it's 9, 7%, seven, about 1 14th, if we need 1 14th of the land, all right, yeah, we could feed the world with 1 14th of the land if, if you can get people acclimated to this kind of diet. So um, this is, uh, there's, there's parts of the world that really can't, from an environmental and resource perspective, cannot afford to, to have a, a livestock industry. Uh, and so this can be a, an important solution for that. Um, the other aspects are around human health. Um, you know, we know that, uh, the, and the World Health Organization has classified red meat and processed meat as carcinogens, and the same, for processed meat, the same classification as asbestos and tobacco. So, um, you know, some important human health impacts as well. And not to mention, and, and I, I don't, I, I generally avoid preachy language, but you know, the fact is that um, the meat industry um, involves billions of, of sentient creatures you know, who have the same level of consciousness that the cats and dogs that most people let into their home that, that are victims of, of uh, you know, our diets. So that doesn't appeal to everybody, but for some people that's you know, something to think about. And, and I, I, uh, I can imagine a, a world when, when, when the children of the students here are growing up where they'll say to, their, that, say to their parents, did you guys really just kill all those animals like that? Was that you know, how you met your dietary needs. Well, along those lines, what do you see as the future of food? Yeah, yeah. So uh, obviously plant-based is a significant piece. I think food is moving in, in two different directions. Here's what's interesting. When, when you and I were growing up, there were basically several dozen food companies. They sold what they wanted um, through a, a limited number of channels, usually two or three grocery state stores within an area, and they marketed through a limited number of channels, you know, TV stations and some radio stations. Today, consumers are so much more empowered. Consumers aren't, we're not restricted to just buying through two or three stores. We can buy really almost infinite channels because you can buy direct, you can buy online, you can buy through drugstore, uh, convenience store, club store. Um, we get our information from so many different sources, not just the established media, but from each other and social media. And as a result, we expect many more options. And, and so I see food moving in two different directions. One direction is what I've called the undoing of food. And Honest Tea represents something like that. Simple, transparent labels where you can literally understand every ingredient, where it came from, how it was made, how, how it was grown. And then the other big trend is around redoing of food. And that's what Beyond Meat represents, you know, using science to, to in, actually improve on a category. And you're seeing, of course, you could look at um, what's happened in the milk category, in the milk case, so plant-based milk whether it's almond milk, oat milk, all of these things are, are redoing of, of a category. Um, but you'll see redoing happen, you're seeing redoing happening in eggs, you'll see it happen in fish. Um, there's redoing of cheese. No one, in my opinion, no one has redone cheese in, in a way that is good yet. Um, but the idea is that you can make better health impacts, better environmental impacts if you're doing it well. Um, so there's, there's still lots of opportunity. Um, I'll also mention, um, that my son and wife, I'm not directly involved in it yet, but have launched a restaurant in Silver Spring called Plant Burger. Uh, and it is a fast food joint uh, that is um, all plant-based. And it's really fun. It's in, it's in the Whole Foods at Silver Spring. Again, check it out. <laughs> uh, 
One of the things that I'd like, if you can share with us and the aspiring entrepreneurs in the audience is, what's your best advice for them as far as starting their business? Yeah, so I think it's great. First of all, you've got an amazing opportunity in, at a wonderful university like this to be able to explore. This is, this is like, you get, to, um, you get to try and you get to fail kind of for free. Like that's, that's the blessing of being in an educational setting. So you should be um, developing ideas and trying them out. So if you are able to be in a, a business plan or uh, whatever the, the analog was for writing a business plan, you know, or getting to develop a pitch for a business idea, try it. Um, you know, I, I did that at Yale. I didn't end up pursuing the business, but I just, I realized that was something I really liked doing. Um, so that whole, pro getting part of that process is a great opportunity and you get to do it for free. I mean, well, you have to pay for your education, but I mean, you get to, the, the danger as an entrepreneur, if you have an idea you're excited about and you go out and try to make it happen and it fails, it costs you money. In, in school, it's kind of part of your education. Um, so you should be trying that out. The other thing I encourage people to do is try doing some sales pitches. Uh, try selling something because sales isn't for everybody. Uh, and sales is hard work. Uh, and part of, being, part of being involved in sales is getting rejection and, and, and being, told, you know, being told no and being able to bounce back. And you need to develop a thick skin for that. Um, you know, any entrepreneur who, who's succeeded, you know, has, I, I, my, my point of view is if, if one in 10, if I get rejected nine times and I can succeed once, that's pretty good. But I got to bounce back from all nine, you know, each, nine of those rejections. And so, uh, you gotta, you gotta have develop a, a thick skin. Absolutely. And the other thing I would say is it's great to um, compete, and I don't, you know, sports is a great way to do it, but there's other ways to compete. You know, sports isn't the only way to compete, and so um, find ways to to compete and 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 uh, you know get your juices going for that too, because I I, I um, you know at Honesty and Beyond Meat we we've, we've got to compete. And, and so part of what you learn in competition is once again, failure, but you also learn resilience. That's great advice, thank you. Switching the topic to philanthropy. Yeah. Uh, what areas are you focused on now in your philanthropy? So we have a bunch of things um, that we're really passionate about. My, my wife works at an organization called Urban Alliance, which is uh, based in DC, but works around the country helping to create economic opportunity for first generation to college students. It's the students who haven't been able to be, um, their family hasn't gone to college uh, and they'll be the first. And so they place them in professional internships. And so for us, um, certainly that's an important and, an issue we're, we care about. So we support Urban Alliance and, and, and she does through her work. Um, another area we are extremely concerned about is climate change. It's, it is, uh, you know, you, you'll hear these studies where they'll say, you know, in 10, we only have 10 years to save the planet. We don't have 10 years. Like, it's, it's, if we don't take action today, if we don't take action really 10 years ago, <laughs> we're not going to save the, the life as we know it on this planet. But um, it is happening right now. And so um, we'd like to fund organ national and local organizations that are taking ag trying to raise consumer awareness around um, their diets. And so locally, uh, we co-founded a group called Bethesda Green which is based in Bethesda and helps create um, all types of environmental awareness there. Um, and then nationally, we're, we're involved in other efforts as well. Um, so those are two big areas. Um, we also involved in education. Um, I've, I've done a lot to support the Yale School of Management and, and uh, other instances. Um, we're just supporting a, a, Emory where our sons went as well. Um, so, um, you know, my parents were both uh, professors, so education is a strong tradition in our family, something we value. Absolutely. Yeah. Is there areas of interest outside of, obviously you're very busy with Beyond Me and, yeah. and um, Honest Tea, but are there other areas that you're focused on business-wise um, outside of? So most of my business work really is around food. I'm involved in a lot of other food companies. I'm on the boards of some other companies. Uh, and we invest in some companies, but I don't go out into other stuff. In terms of where I'm going to put my time and energy, my, my best value add is around food. Um, so that's where I, I, I focus. I, I love to see entrepreneurs. Um, so there's some entrepreneurs who I've supported who've gone off and launched additional companies, and I'll invest in them. Um, but I don't get too far outside of food, partially because 
the wonderful thing about food is, so I talked about climate change being so important, and you could say, well, if you really care about climate change, maybe you should also invest in fuel cells, which you know, I'm, I'm sure somebody somewhere is working on something important there. But what I love about food um, is that it's something people touch every day, three times a day, usually, right? And so you know, if you think fuel cells is the way to address it, most people in this audience aren't going to be able to interact with fuel cells on a, on a daily basis, meaning you aren't going to be able to take conscious action. Um, but if you, and I, the fact is that food is the single biggest footprint, or we call it food print, people have in terms of their impact on the environment. And so if I can help people connect their concerns around the environment with their diet, that's a big step. And, and one of the great phrases in, in launching the restaurant, my son came up with this phrase. So there's the Gandhi phrase, be the change you wish to see in the world. And my son came up with the phrase, eat the change. Uh, and so. Uh, that's a to me that's a really powerful idea helping people understand that what you eat and of course change is such you know dual meaning of change um, and so how do we how do we help people eat the change i've had the pleasure of visiting you in your headquarters and seeing some of the quotes on your wall and so yeah. forth. can you share some of those sure uh, sure so uh we have bottle cap quotes you know under every cap there's a quote um and so a few of my favorite two, two of my favorites are chinese proverbs the first is if we don't change the direction we are headed, we will end up where we are going. And uh, of course it's true, right? Um, but that's really powerful when you think, so you, I, just what I talked about with respect to the environment, like if we don't change the direction we're headed, we're headed toward this place where within 10 years, life as we know it uh, will not exist. And that's, that's amazing that that's gonna, that's gonna happen in your lifetime too. Um, so we have to absolutely change that. The other way to look at it is from a health impact. And so just as we have, I don't want to depress everyone here, but obviously the environmental front's depressing, but the health front is depressing too. Uh, every, every few years, the United Nations ranks the average life expectancy of all the countries in the world. There's about 200 countries in the world. So before I looked at these rankings going into it, I thought, well, the US, okay, we're the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. We've got more knowledge of science and medicine and nutrition than any civilization in history has ever had. We spend more per capita on healthcare than any country. Where's the US gonna rank? Well, Japan was number one, Italy was number two, the United States was ranked 33rd in average life expectancy. And to me, that's, that's shameful. That's, here's a country, the wealthiest nation, that's squandered its fortune, and it's, it's literally not living up to its potential. So uh, we have to change that direction. And, and as much as it's shameful, it's also an incredible business opportunity, right? To help the world's wealthiest nation live healthier, higher quality lives. Everybody wants to live a, a higher quality, healthy life. You just need to make it accessible. Um, so to me, that's something that's powerful. The other quote that is the one we have on our wall, it's a Chinese proverb that says, those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt the people doing it. And so uh, that's very much the work that I like to engage in. And, and there's always skeptics. And frankly, there's skeptics when we sold to Coca-Cola who said, ah, you know, Coke's going to marginalize the brand. They're not going to, it, it's not going to be brought to scale. Or it's going to be cheapened. It's going to be compromised. They're going to add sugar. They're going to make it not organic. Or they're going to cut out the fair trade. And, and, and the, the opposite is true. So, um, you know, by definition, an entrepreneur is doing what others say cannot be done. Yeah. Very true. Is there a, uh, I mean, it's been unbelievable what you've provided us and we're sort of coming towards the end here, but is there a final thought that you'd like to leave us with? Well, I'll just say this is a really exciting moment for the, the business world and for student to be a student thinking and interested in, in entrepreneurship. Because I, certainly in my lifetime, there's never been a moment where there's so much disruption happening. And, and you know, that term gets overused, but I mean, think about that. Um, two years ago, Meat was meat, and today, meat isn't meat. I mean, that's, that's, that's amazing to see that kind of change happen. And um, I'm willing to bet that transportation today is not transportation two years from now. Uh, we already know that lodging is not what it was. So all around, um, there's all types of areas of, of opportunity. And, and so what a great time to be, to be learning. And I, I, certainly as a student, I encourage you to get that broad base of skills. I mean, specialize certainly and go dig deep on something, but make sure you can be fluent in all the languages of business. You have to understand accounting and marketing and, and, and all of those things. Um, but it, it is, uh, and then I think what I, what I always encourage students to do is, is make sure you understand what you really care about. Uh, and the easy path 
when you're in a great school like this, you know, recruiters are going to come and they're going to recruit and, and the great jobs will become available to you. But just because they do don't, doesn't mean that's what you should do. Make sure you find what you're passionate about. And, and I'm not a believer in taking the values neutral course. You know, so you'll hear someone say, ah, I'm going to do this for a few years and then I'm going to go do what I care about. And, and you know, a lot of, we know a lot how a lot of that ends. They, they say, uh, you come in as a butterfly and you leave as a caterpillar, you know? So <laughs> um, if you care, find out what you care about and don't ever back down from that. Um, it, it, the worst outcome is you get to be good at something you don't like doing. And you get, you know, you start doing that work and you're, you get a, a high burn rate because you're, you know, getting paid well. And then you look up five, 10 years and you say, ah, you know, uh, to me, that's such a shame. You only, uh, I don't want to get too preachy, but you really do only have one life. And so make sure you get to, to do something that, that's meaningful to you every day. And, and when you get the chance to do that, and, um, you know, there's no guarantee of success, right? Um, you're, you're, but if you get to act with conviction and act in things you believe in, there, <laughs> there's no, um, there's a guarantee it won't be a failure. I mean, meaning the business might fail, but personally, you'll feel like I did something I, care, I cared about and I got to ex express that. You know, and there'll be other opportunities, but um, this is an exciting moment to be entering the business world. And uh, I hope everyone here gets to make the most of that opportunity. Thank you so much for being with us sure, here tonight. Sure, sure. I know it was a difficult thing to no, get out a, of I'm your glad schedule. No, I'm glad we can make it work. Thank you very sure. much. Great to be with you all.